Hi, we're Tony and Chelsea, and welcome to our podcast, Picture This. Today we're talking about Ansel Adams, the, the world's most famous photographer. And there's already a lot of information out there about Ansel Adams, but we're going to be giving a little bit of a different spin on it. Yes, we're going to be covering his life and looking at his pictures, but we're also going to be talking about why he is so notable, why he's kind of famous. We're going to be looking at the business decisions that he made and not just like technical choices like the zone system, though we will kind of get into that. Before we do, yes. I have to say, this episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas or your portfolio. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. You can try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony. And if you use the coupon code portfolio, you will get 10% off. Ansel would have liked Squarespace. He put a lot of energy into his portfolios and making his photos look good there was a lot done there's a lot done after the pictures so we'll, i just that that's we'll just like that a little bit wow very presumptuous he probably also would have liked squarespace he probably would have took liked a me. lot of sponsorships he did <laughs> yeah he was sponsored by uh, everybody from like boot companies to camera companies and nissan dang so certainly squarespace would have sought him out uh but let's start at the beginning when he was a kid he grew up in in san francisco his parents were fairly wealthy, and he had a nice view of the Golden Gate Bridge. Whoa. And he was, everybody kind of generally considers him a real pain as a kid, just he like was, a brat. He was a brat? Yeah. He, he later in life said that if such a diagnosis had existed at the time, he would have been ADD. ADHD? Or ADHD. Yeah. Uh, and so he was hyper. That's hyperactivity, which is a very commonly thing common thing now and nowadays if the kid behind you is is repeatedly hitting you with their worksheet the teacher probably pulls them aside and, and gives them some uh focal in or something because they probably have add and that settles them down a little bit that didn't exist that kid was just a pain and that was ansel adams um, wow. a lot of people said he was probably also dyslexic something that also wasn't diagnosed at the time and that meant that he probably wasn't excelling at school, dyslexic people have, find it really difficult to to learn to read and write under traditional teaching methods. So he, he wasn't a star student. And this is this is a, a common theme that we see among the most successful people in the world, right? Because we all grew up with our parents telling us, get straight A's and you'll do well in life. But then you yeah. look at these people who didn't excel at school and also did well in life. And I think it's more he became a notable person because he had unusual traits and that can sometimes spin people off in the wrong direction or he took all that energy and put it in, in the right direction. Part of that was just choices that his parents made. Yeah. What were those? What did his parents do? They seemed to continually find things to keep him busy. So they, all the, all the parents right now with hyperactive kids are like, tell me. <laughs> They're like taking notes, hoping they get a little Ansel. Yeah. Um, Actually, it, it, well, I won't even say it. It sounds like his, his mom wasn't a huge fan. What? Why? Why would? What? <laughs> because your kid was just a pain. What did you read, though, that made you think that? You know, it's all like third-hand accounts, which is why I even feel bad saying that, because obviously his parents are, are long dead. Yeah, they loved him, probably. <laughs> yeah, but it seems like he was... Anyway, they put him in piano lessons a lot. So he spent a lot, a lot of time playing piano. And this was his trajectory up until his mid-20s was going to be a professional musician. I did know that about him. Yeah, yeah. and and even, he, he always played the piano. He was entertained at parties by playing the piano. He never stopped loving the piano, but that wasn't what made him famous. <laughs> when he was 14, his parents took him to Yosemite, which now is like a five hour drive from San Francisco. It probably took him a little bit longer at the time, but it wasn't that far. Yeah. And his dad put in his hands a, a Kodak Browning can camera, which, by today's standards, would be like the worst piece of crap camera you could possibly imagine. We should do a photo challenge with that thing. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that we have one of those. We have some similar cameras. And you stick some film in the back, and it's it's just a box. It's just a, a big black box with a little viewfinder that you peer in at the top. And it, there's no batteries, or you just crank it, yeah. and you release it. And uh, even composing a picture is pretty hard. And... His first set of pictures were bad. They yeah. were just bad by his own 
account that pictures didn't turn out well. But he thought Yosemite was this beautiful place. And, and here's what he had to say about Yosemite. He says, The splendor of Yosemite burst upon us, and it was glorious. One wonder after another descended upon us. There was light everywhere, and a new era began for me. So oh, he that's was, so sweet. Yeah, he was, he was, his writing is very poetic. He wrote a lot too. So there's plenty of, of quotes <laughs> that you can have about Ansel yeah. Adams. And a lot of it has that kind of poetic and dramatic flair to it. But he loved Yosemite and his pictures did not reflect the beauty that he saw. Which is kind of like my own origin story in photography, which is just like, oh, I took a picture, but it's not what I wanted. This didn't turn out. Now I need to go get a better camera. I need to learn more about photography. And, and so you go down this rat hole of <laughs> figuring out why your pictures aren't perfect. And that he spent much of his early years in that rat hole. So after his pictures didn't turn out great, he uh, started studying photography and got himself a camera and he got himself a better tripod. And then when he was 15, he went back to Yosemite again. And this time his pictures turned out a little bit better, but certainly not the quality of the photographs that we've come to know Ansel Adams for. Yeah. And so I, I kind of like to make this point because nowadays we talk to, we talk to beginning photographers every day and a lot of them are frustrated that they just bought their new Pro Canon 60 yeah. and their pictures are not like Ansel Adams. So is their camera broken or do they not have that gift? Yeah. No, Ansel Adams was not, Ansel Adams in the beginning. <laughs> he was not the Ansel Adams that we know. He was a beginner taking eh, snapshots. We all start out at that point. And then Ansel Adams became Ansel Adams, you know, Hard after work, decades and decades yeah. of work. And there, there was a lot that went into it. Just that annoying, that annoying persistence that once bugged everyone now had, he now had somewhere to put it. Yeah, that, that's a great point to make. It is that same energy that was that was not compatible with school mm -hmm. was terribly compatible with this sort of thing and he would shut himself away from people for months at a time while he was mastering something like printmaking hyper focusing he would hyper focus yeah yeah at least based on what i've read um so in 1921 when he turns 19 now he's he's publishes his first photos so he starts actually making prints and, but, and he keeps shooting and he keeps specifically going back to Yosemite park because it's probably the closest, like beautiful place. He doesn't seem to, I've never seen pictures taken of the, the golden gate bridge by him, even though he lived there. I don't know if it was too familiar to him or if he was just, I think he was just into nature. I think yeah. man-made structures didn't have any interest to him. Um, but it, this is fortunate for him. This works out well for his career because it, it was, it's, the right place, right time component to his we success. We see that a lot when we research people. A lot of right place, right time, kind of uh, being prepared, meeting opportunity type of stuff. Yeah. Um, so American ex America expanding into the West is is big news at the time. And we're only really, as a country, starting to appreciate the grand Rocky Mountains and things of nature. Because up until this point, uh, those things were considered kind of a pain. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Why? Because they're building railroads and things like that? Like they were an obstacle or what? Because we settlers had too much nature. <laughs> they were trying to get away from nature because nature was, was cold and didn't have food. So we kind of liked things like houses and fires. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we're, we're starting to settle down and people, maybe they're getting cooped up a little bit and they're starting to actually appreciate the beauty of nature more and more and more. Okay. So right place, right time. Landscape photography, still popular, but at the time, this was really an important genre. And he's spending a lot of time in Yosemite, and there's a little art gallery there, a little studio called Best's Studio. It's named for the owner, Harry Best. He and his family kind of live and work there, and he sells, Harry sells his landscape paintings, as well as like souvenirs and tchotchkes and stuff. So it's, a it's still at Yosemite, that same shop is there. And, uh, Ansel befriends him, and Harry has a piano back at the house. So there he practices on Harry's piano. They all make friends. This is this is a key to the story. <laughs> Why? Tell me more, quick. <laughs> okay, so, well, the, the first thing is that Harry starts selling Ansel's prints at the store. So oh, Ansel is taking pictures networking. and making prints. He, okay. He's making friends. And now he's got a commercial outlet. He's got a sales channel, so he can start to make a little bit of money. And I think... Through that sales process, you also learn 
right? Because you see that some prints sell and some prints don't. And you that, that's honest critics. Most honest critic is someone's money. Yeah, right. Because people will happily give you a like on Facebook if your picture sucks yeah, because they like, want to make oh, you feel God, good. I feel bad for you. Click. But you say, hey, give me 10 bucks for this picture. They're going to be a little more selective about it. Yeah. But this sort of getting outside feedback still continues to be a really important part of photography. And he, not everybody had that opportunity, but he did. So we got to learn those lessons really, really early. A little bit later, in his early 20s, Ansel is experimenting with more creative and artistic forms of photography. So at the time, photography wasn't quite as literal as it is today. It wasn't trying to document something so much as it was replicating other forms of art, like watercolor, other types of painting. So a lot of it is very sub soft and subjective. So things like soft focus, where everything is kind of blurry, is kind of replicating watercolors. And they would do etchings and kind of interesting prints. But nobody was especially interested in just like literal prints, like Ansel Adams is known for, like just documenting kind of this mm. is what it looked like. Um, so he's doing a lot of uh, creative things, and he connects with um, Alfred Steiglitz. Oh, we learned about him. Right? Yeah, another famous photographer and a photographer who was very interested in this artistic art form. And they had a, a lasting relationship for, as, as far as I know, for as long as Steiglitz was around. I think part of that influenced Adam's first portfolio, which he published when he was 25. And it was a set of, of 18 prints. Here are a couple of them. Like, that's, that's a good picture, right? No. I mean, <laughs> not by... I know that he was working with gear that was not like anything that we use today. But, like, the dynamic range isn't great and all of that. Yeah. yeah he's got some compositional elements. And, and we're also... listening to the podcast, this is a, a landscape and it's mountains and a couple of trees in the foreground. And it doesn't have a ton of detail. It's pretty washed out looking um it, it's yeah. it's hard to particularly assess the dynamic range because adams was so particular about the printmaking process like yeah. he liked to make his own prints and i don't know that that's captured with the digital image that we're looking at uh so so who really knows about that but yeah but you're right it's not a picture that you'd stop on instagram if you were flipping past no but it's a good picture it's, it's got good. you can see there's deliberate yeah uh, lines and kind of rule of thirds composition there. No, the good picture. You oh, got, he's starting to play with light more. Yeah, the sun kind of rising up and illuminating snow-capped mountains. And you see just, you know, a foreground and a background and, uh, you know, just layers here. And still, it's not, most of the pictures in his first portfolio were not things that you would note. And he's 25 at this point, so he's been shooting for a good decade already. He's hey, 10 years in and I'm obsessed with it. That's encouraging. I feel that way too. It takes a lot of time to master your craft. Um, this oh, picture, beautiful. I think, is my favorite of the set. It's, yeah. it's again, a classic rule of thirds composition with the mountains in the lower third, but then the upper two thirds are just like storm clouds. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the dynamic range here is, is pretty remarkable. We've got like bright white highlights, what he'd probably call a 10 on a zone system from zero to 10. And then some dark shadows, which he'd probably label a zero on his own system. And then lots of detail in the tonal range from like three to seven. This is his own system from yeah. zero to 10. And it's this very complex system that not many photographers in history ever used, but everybody talks about. <laughs> uh, what do you mean they never use it? People use it? Some people do, but not many because it ended up, it ended up being very complex and difficult. Like he would spot meter different parts of the picture and decide he, it, it gave him a way to look at a scene and then imagine the final print and how it would look. And he would say, I need this to be a three, but I also have to make sure that these highlights in the clouds aren't blown out. So we'd take a spot meter and he would calculate the number of stops difference between the brightest parts and the darkest parts. And that would allow him to dial in the right settings for his, his camera and just kind of nail the exposure. It's just so interesting. We teach photography, so every day people are asking us questions and assuming that there's one way to do everything. So you have Ansel Adams, who is just so technical. And mm -hmm. then you have these other great street photographers who will admit uh, that they never, like Mary Ellen Mark, never really cared much for the technical side. She was excellent, but she was more about capturing a moment or an emotion. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that it's interesting that this goes to show there's more than one way to go about it yeah. and, and get a great picture. So anyway, sorry, go go ahead. 
Um, that's a really valid point. And he, he would, the zone system extended into the development process. So sometimes he would use different chemicals and different times to get more contrast or less contrast out of it, but he'd have to be making note. And of course the whole role would have to be developed one way. And then as well in the printing process, he knew that his own system had 10 stops, but he could actually recover a couple of extra stops. Like there was also a zone 12, a zone 11 and zone 12 above white, white yeah. that he could manage to, to pull down if he needed to, not unlike dynamic range mm -hmm. in our current raw files, where we often end up deliberately kind of recovering the highlights to get a good image. So we we still use a lot of these different principles, but thankfully we don't have to spot meter different parts of the scene. Uh, a lot of photographers examined his own system at the time, and they just decided, I'll just I'll just bracket my shots. I'd rather just take three shots and to try to figure everything out, uh, and then use the exposure that happened to be perfect. But he was very meticulous about it, and he seemed to like this sort of complexity. Um, uh, if anything, I think the zone system became a bit of a distraction to every photographer trying to learn from his style, because people so much associated the zone system with Ansel Adams that they would think if they want to take pictures like Ansel Adams, they had to use it. They had to figure out the zone system, but that was not Ansel Adams' secret. And technical details are not any photographer's secret, really. Ansel Adams' trick here was he basically lived in Yosemite. He spent months and months at a time. He had very distinct compositional uh, styles, too. Yeah, well, and he had studied art. Just He was a round artist, and he was, so he was learning the composition. Studying art is important. It is. That's but, why we're here. Yeah, but he was, most more than anything, he was putting the time in. Yeah. Months and months at a time, because this picture is defined by the beautiful clouds filling the sky. And if you show up on a random day, you're going to get an all-white sky or an all-blue sky or something. So he found the spot and he waited for it all to come together. And that's what you need as a landscape photographer. It's not about getting the right camera settings, certainly. Yeah. This picture, probably the the historically the picture that holds up the most. This is called Monolight, the face of Half Dome. And it was taken with his Corona viewfinder camera. The sky here is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the sky is, is black. It's a black and white photo, of course. All his pictures are pretty much black and white. But the sky in person wasn't really black, of course. The sky is pretty much always the it? brightest part of the picture. Here's the frame he took right before that. And the blurriness is just because of the image that I found. But you can see the sky here is very white and the picture has much less contrast and it's it's not as good, right? I agree, yeah. The, the difference is he took the picture on the right first and of course he couldn't see it at the time because it's film, <laughs> but he could envision it in his head and he thought this would turn out the way I see it. It was my eyes, but it's not what I see in my mind. It's not my vision. I wouldn't be capturing the beauty that I feel and so the way he explains it is he wanted to capture the feeling of the location rather than just the look of the location. So what he did was he put a, a heavy red filter on his lens. Red filters, they block out everything except red light. Yeah. So you, if you took a color picture, the whole scene would just be red. <laughs> but it's a black and white picture. So the more red light that gets through, the brighter it's going to end up. And a little bit of physics, anything that's white or a shade of gray has equal amounts of red, blue, and green light coming through. Um, so the snow, of course, is still white, even with the red filter. The rock still shades of gray, but the sky becomes black because the sky is blue. blue. Yeah. And the red filter is blocking all the red light. Uh, I love that because so many people cite Ansel Adams as a purist. And when I say so many people, I just mean people on the internet that I get into discussions with. But they'll say things like, oh, Photoshop, I don't use that. Ansel Adams didn't need it, but Ansel Adams loved to change things. And you saying that he, his intention was to capture the feeling of the location is so important to me personally as a photographer, because for me, that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. You have to capture what's important to you about the scene. And so he found a way to do that by adding a red filter. That's pretty brilliant. Uh, he, he does end up playing both sides of the coin though. Because he, he, he turns a corner on this later. Oh my gosh, really? Because I've seen his work in the darkroom and he changes photos more in the darkroom than I have in Photoshop sometimes. Yeah, he, he really does. So th there is this kind of... He is annoying. I totally <laughs> side with his mom. 
<laughs> Taking uh, the mom's side on this one. I also want to make the point that in his discussion of his, his train of thought, he's he's shooting for post, basically. Yeah. He's thinking about the post processing. He's envisioning something that's not really there. And I think skilled photographers nowadays do that too. You take a scene and you think, the power lines ruin this, but mm, I can Photoshop that out. Yeah. And then I can capture what I actually see or or what I feel because you don't feel the power lines in a landscape. You don't see you power lines them. anymore. No, yeah. you don't see them until you take the picture. So yeah, there comes a point when you can see what the camera's going to capture before you lift the camera to your eye. And then there's another level beyond that when you can picture how it will look after you process it. Yeah. And sometimes you might not take a shot because you can't picture that. So before we get to that change in his life, another change in life, he, he marries uh, Virginia Best, Harry Best's he daughter married... at the Best Studio. What? Yeah, he's been dating this chick. Gosh. Their he, daughter. He can really milk a contact, huh? First he gets his photo sold, he gets <laughs> yeah. to play their piano, and then he marries their kid? Oh, yeah. Um, he's, he's a wild they, one. They had an ongoing relationship. They actually dated for like a long time, for that period of time. You know, you didn't date people for half a decade back then, but he dated Virginia for a while, and then he told her, ah, you know, I'm a professional musician. I can't get married. Marriage and being a musician aren't compatible. Oh, yeah, you know how those concert pianists are? Yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's crazy what they do. I can't say it. This is a family podcast, but it gets wild. He he goes back to Virginia and decides he's going to be become a photographer. He gives up his dream of becoming a professional musician. Okay. Uh, he's been like teaching piano and such this whole time, but he decides his fingers are too stubby. Whoa. I know, not like Donald Trump, who I'm sure could be a concert pianist. Ansel Adams' fingers. You had to bring it there. <laughs> so they they get married at Best Studios in Yosemite, and uh, they basically live there together for the rest of his life, almost the rest of his life, like literally in Yosemite. Dang. In Yosemite. <laughs> we need to go visit. Yeah, we've, we've never been to Yosemite. It, it almost feels like a cliche thing for photographers to kind of chase the shots that Ansel Adams made, especially once you know that he lived there and that's how he got the best shots is because he was there for years at a time waiting for the sun and the moon and the clouds to, and the snow. You have to do it that way. Right. That that was one of his bi biggest secrets to success was just that he was there he's for persistent. so much. Um, I also say another one of the secrets to his success was that he, he sacrificed a lot. He was gone for months at a time. And he was gone when his first child was born. He was just in the Sierra foothills, like Typical outside Ansel. Yosemite, taking pictures. And he was doing the same thing when his second child was born. Oh, again? Doesn't he know <laughs> how long it takes to bake a kid? Come on. Uh, so Virginia was back having kids and raising the kids, and he was working on his professional career. He was a very ambitious person. and And sometimes, uh, sort of that sort of success requires personal sacrifices, not just from you, but from everyone in your family. Yeah. And you know, it's a, it's a difficult choice for many people to make who, who want to be successful. And that's the way he made it. And, uh, when I, I did so much research into this and a lot of people, when they talk about his marriage, they talk about it as not being that great though. Everybody described Virginia as just like a fantastic home homemaker and a, a great host. He often hosted parties and she seemed to constantly support his career. They're always like, Ansel, eh. This is so weird for me. You did the research on this podcast. Yeah. Um, but I did not think it was going to be like the why Ansel Adams is annoying story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't want it to be like that. I think he's, he's an <laughs> amazing artist, but at the same time, I, I think it would be foolish to talk about why his pictures are good and not talk about the sacrifices that he made for it. No, you make a really good point. I think that's, I think that's all part of it. And, and, and I didn't know either one of them. Of course I was, I was 10 years old when he died. It's not like I can say any of this firsthand. So all of this is, is second or third hand accounts that I've researched. Um, but yeah, he, he, he did make sacrifices. Um, and, and so did his family, but he also had a lasting impact on the entire world. You know, he, he, his photographs were a big part of a, a couple of national parks being made. And he was a wildlife conservationist, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He, he certainly uh, saved massive swaths of land and, and many, many 
animals' lives and, and had a lasting impact, especially on the photography community. But his, his work made so many millions of people in the world a, appreciate nature and probably go out and actually look at it because maybe they ended up with a poster on their dorm room wall like I did, made by Ansel Adams. So there's only so many places that you can put all of your energy. And for Ansel, it was, and for Ansel, it was all about nature and photography. Maybe everything else came second. Yeah, and I don't think every, everybody would be comfortable with that sacrifice. But in my point of view, I mean, it's hard to know what he gave up because his, his children, at least his son, I saw an interview with his son who seemed to speak highly of him. So I don't think yeah. there's resentment there or anything. And, and I think there are plenty of people out there uh, leading very normal lives. And Ansel Adams didn't lead a normal life. He led an exceptional life. And, That's cool. Yeah. Well, wow, you're uh, really turning this around. <laughs> uh, he he's social. He's hanging out with George O'Keefe and Paul Strand. He's making friends. He's exchanging art tips and and developing himself. Uh, when he's 29 in 1931, he has a solo exhibit at the Smithsonian Institute. Ooh. I know, right? Like that's a big deal. That's a pretty big. At 29. 29. Yeah. So 1932, uh, along with another landscape photographer, Willard Van Dyke, he forms the Group F-64. I've heard of them. And this is a big departure because the Group F-64 has what they call a manifesto. And basically it's saying, we're going to be very literal in our photography. We're not going to be doing any of the soft focus or mm -hmm. etching or any of that. F-64 refers to having a very small opening in the lens, which should give you sharp pictures from the foreground to the background. Because they're specifically saying this like shallow depth of field background blur stuff. No. They're not okay with that. They're like, keep that. I want a bunch of depth of field. No bouquet for him. Okay. From when I heard of the club, it wasn't like some formal get together thing. A lot of people considered themselves to be a part of the club without Ansel Adams even knowing about it. It was just kind of like a cult following at some point, right? Yeah. And there were people who were described as members of F64 who say they were never members of anything. <laughs> so Dang, yeah, it wasn't it like... It got controversial. Yeah. But specifically pictures like the the photo of of uh, that we talked about earlier with the red filter wouldn't have been allowed at oh. F64. Oh, so is that this, a turn is this his turning point? Yeah, at this point, he becomes much more literal so about it all. joins a club and changes things? Just because I know parts of our nerdy audience are thinking about this. What are they thinking about? Right now, if you're a landscape photographer and you shoot at a really high f-stop number diffraction? like F64, diffraction wrecks your sharpness, right? Oh, yeah. I was wondering about that. Were you really? Yeah. Well, you with, seem surprised, but what you don't realize is I'm brilliant. <laughs> first, the f-stop is is basically relative to the size of the film or the size of the sensor. Yeah. And so he's they working were shooting with large medium, format. Oh yeah, large format or medium. So f64 is not as small as it would be on a 35 millimeter what or APS-C camera. What would the equivalent camera. be? I am not sure, but it'd probably be more like f16 or f22. Oh okay. But even with a 35 millimeter camera, at those points, you're getting less and less sharp images because of diffraction, which is this weird quality of light as it passes through you a small opening. You would have ruined their club. <laughs> Going on and on you about this. You would have been like, what about focus stacking, guys? so unpopular. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they wanted sharp images specifically, but another factor that would cause diffraction to not have that big of an impact is their glass just wasn't that sharp. So we notice diffraction now uh, because, because we have so much sharper. high megapixel sensors and super sharp glass. They had good gear, but it, by modern standards, it just didn't compare. So they were really getting sharp images at F64, as least as sharp as they were going to get. Okay. So in, in 1935, um, he's in his early 30s. Virginia's dad dies. Harry dies. Oh, no. And I loved him. they take over the studio and they, they basically just live there. And so now it basically became the Adams at Ansel Adams Gallery, which is, it's still known as the Ansel Adams Gallery today. And it's the filled name? with his own work. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Not cool. <laughs> <laughs> so Ansel, Ansel is selling his prints there, but he's also, that's not really how he's making his living. I think we all kind of imagine. What's he doing? He, he's doing commercial work. Oh. So like literally AT&T will call him up to get some some nature pictures that they might use in advertising or something. Um, he's doing commercial work for Kodak, Fortune Magazine, Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, he's an editor of a popular photography magazine, US Camera and Travel. The guy's just, he's grinding. He's, he's not 
necessarily doing the dream work that everybody imagines a landscape photographer. Oh, doing, I'm but he's filing working. all this away for the trolls. When they <laughs> yeah. call us shills, I'll be like, I'm just doing what Ansel did. Yeah, literally Ansel Adams had a camera sponsorship. Yeah. He had a sponsorship from, from Dotson. If you test drove a Dotson, they'd plant a tree in An Ansel Adams' name. Whoa, that's cool. It, it is cool, right? Uh, boots. Um, boots? He, he also wrote books. He wrote a lot of of Whoa. educational books for people learning photography, as well as fine art books just kind of filled with his work. And, you know, he's he's making a good living, but he's not wealthy from this. Uh, he doesn't. Did, was he wealthy during his lifetime? I, I guess it depends on what you would consider wealthy. He was well known, and and certainly he was able to feed his family and stuff. But he didn't really become wealthy until he was about sixty nine, and then he met a guy named Bill Turnage, who just said, "Hey, I can help you out with some of this business stuff. Let's let's change the way you're doing prints. Let's start doing limited edition print, edition prints because he hadn't really been doing. He gave him a business model. Yeah, and and some some marketing tips to make his prints more valuable. Like we're only going to sell twelve of these. And uh, Bill Turnage really turned it around for him. And I think Bill Turnage deserves a lot of credit for the reason we know Ansel Adams' name, because he seems to have been a key part of getting Ansel Adams' pictures on coffee mugs and calendars and that kind of thing. This happens a lot with artists. Dali, his wife, <laughs> was the one that promoted all of his work. Yeah. And um, oh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I can't think of the name right now. But there was another photographer and they had a friend that just taught them how to promote everything. Mm -hmm. This happens a lot where you have a great artist, but they just don't know how to get their work out there. And and this happens still today all the time. We know a lot of really talented photographers who aren't that well known because they're a little shy about their work. And they take great pictures and maybe they'll put a picture on Facebook or they'll send it to us, but they don't publicize it. Mm -hmm. And so getting to be a well-known photographer requires... A, a little bit of both. And in fact, it might even be, you know, 30% photography and 60% business. It, it's a different mix. Um, and a lot of times the artistic mind is not good at the business side. And in that case, it was kind of the case for Ansel. Like he did a lot of commercial work, but it was still somebody else had to come in and tell him, we're going to make some money. Let's what turn this around. What else did they do? He uh, had an I Heart Ansel t-shirt made <laughs> and then he plugged it on his YouTube channel. Um. Well, every, everywhere you see Ansel Adams stuff, like the poster that I had on my dorm room wall, is probably largely responsible, largely the the, the work of the uh, work of Bill Turnage. Um, and Ansel became the first mass marketed fine arts photographer in the world because of that relationship. Well, so networking was very important for him. His first work was seen because he made friends with another person, mm -hmm. and then his fame was perpetuated by someone that was good at business. That's, hey, that's a real accomplishment for someone as annoying as Ansel Adams. Yeah, even people who knew him as an adult would describe him as mm, odd. They always do like, oh, mm, he's, he's an odd guy. Really? Who? I want to know, like, what did people say? Uh, I'm, I'm joking about him being annoying because I think it's funny, but he, like you're verifying people felt this way. Yeah, I, I think he got away with it because people considered him to be an eccentric, an eccentric artist. Yeah. Uh, cool. So he probably wouldn't have been... <laughs> great at you know selling uh coffee mugs to commercial clients but he was but slapping his picture on a mug and getting to know other artists his personality kind of worked out well okay he would be an extreme extrovert for three months and then he would get sick of people and disappear into the mountains for three months and take That's pictures not acceptable wouldn't you be so disappointed if like people got interviewed and asked about you and everyone was like oh yeah he's super annoying so speaking of his, his fame, who do you think is the second most famous photographer in the world? Um, I don't know. It's Annie Leibovitz. She, Ansel is about three times more commonly searched on Google Trends than Annie Leibovitz. Who did you search? Uh, I, I went through lists of famous photographers, and Ansel Adams was bigger than all of them by a factor of three. Ansel is bigger than both David LaChapelle and Annie Leibovitz put together. Now. Whoa. It's not just the quality of his work. The quality of work was stellar. He has absolutely beautiful images and a fantastic portfolio. But a lot of it is almost circular. Like the fact that he got to be a little bit famous meant everybody was making Ansel Adams calendars, meant that 
everybody would see the calendars and start to know the name Ansel Adams, making him even more famous. Can I make some suggestions? Yeah, <laughs> for Ansel Adams? Um, no, just so and why I think he also is very well known. Oh, yeah. Um, his work is very beautiful, but also unoffensive. Mm -hmm. Like everyone who's going to be like, a tree, I hate that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and he depicts it in a really beautiful way, but also it's very recognizable. Mm -hmm. So people know his birch trees. Um, people know his black and white landscapes. The, he has a signature style, it's like branding almost. Yeah, and I, I find that a lot of photographers want to associate themselves in one way or another with, with Ansel Adams more than any other photographer. He's a photographer's photographer, partly because I think he developed the, the zone system and Group F64 and photographers like that kind of technical stuff, like he innovated and such. He wasn't just a photographer, but he was a technical guy too. And I think they kind of like that about him. And, and so even today, like you mentioned, people will say, would Ansel Adams have edited that shot? Well, I feel like that's like, people think that's the Trump card. Like if he did it, he must be right. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, Ansel Adams would have edited it and he would have taken sponsorships for it and he would have slapped it on the side of a coffee mug or a t-shirt and tried to sell that to you. <laughs> awesome. And I think all that is fine because if he hadn't figured out a way to make money taking pictures, he, he would have he would have had to make money pushing a broom or or digging a ditch or... <laughs> Uh, I don't know, teaching piano or something. He he just, you have to have a job, right? You have to yeah. feed yourself. So either you figure out a way to, to sell your work and your skill, in which case you get to pursue it a little bit more, or it becomes a hobby to you. Yeah, and it's not unusual. I, we've been researching dozens of famous photographers for this podcast, and so many of them did work they didn't really want to do or that they weren't proud of um, because they had to, a lot of them said, pay the bills to fund what they really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. That's something we talk about. We like to take pictures of whatever we want and we pay those. We were able to do that because we teach other people. It's yeah. kind of like, you know, I like them both, but I really like making pictures. So yeah, you can't judge somebody. They want to live the life that they want to live. He had to endorse some boots, whatever. He got to take great pictures. Yeah. He lived until 82. He died in 1984. And his wife, Virginia, uh, lived up until the year 2000. She lived until 96. Whoa, whoa. whoa. Yeah. 96. So, and she spent almost all that time living in Yosemite. Wow. Yeah, she just really loved nature, and she just always wanted to be out there. And who could blame her? Just such a beautiful place that I think all of us appreciate because of Ansel Adams' work. I don't know how much we would know about Yosemite if it weren't for the work that he did and, and how he shared it. To just kind of quickly recap the secrets to his success, he had he had early support from his parents, um, both financially, but also they physically put things like a piano and a camera in his hands. I bet they also put a baseball bat and uh, a paintbrush in his hands too, and those things just didn't take. But whatever he was into, he got the opportunity to pursue it, and he didn't you know have to go off and fight in a war or anything. It was, yeah, it was great. His parents um, were wealthy. Yeah, it was also kind of the right place, right time. So if it, if it had been 20 years earlier, well, photography might not have existed in its form or landscape photography might not have been popular. There might not have been something as compact and easy as the con, uh, the Kodak Brownie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and even if it happened now, like I don't think we see a lot of, th there were a couple that, of landscape photographers that managed to make a living at it, but nowadays it would be much harder. It's just not as, it's just almost too common now <laughs> doing landscape photography. He's also an ambitious person with a ton of energy mm -hmm. who didn't get it killed by the school system. <laughs> and he was good at making relationships, even though everybody seemed to describe him as odd. He had seemed to have a lot of prominent and skilled and artistic friends. Yeah, clearly there was something likable about him. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, as a landscape photographer, lo location is the most important thing and putting a lot of time is in is the most important thing. And he literally lived inside of Yosemite. Uh, and, and, and finally, I think he, well, he, he took a lot of risks in what he did. He certainly could have pursued a, a more sure thing, Yeah. but um, he also managed to pay the bills doing commercial work. And that, I think that's going to be key to anybody who has a, a long career in photography. Yeah. And he made a lot of sacrifices too. And yeah, he was willing to make sacrifices, whether or not, not those sacrifices aren't for everybody, but they were for him and they were a key to his, his success. Mm. So Chelsea, who, who makes this sort of informational podcast possible? Ansel Adams. 
Ansel Adams. Is this episode sponsored by Ansel Adams? No. <laughs> Oh, this episode is actually brought to you by Squarespace. It's the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, online store, or portfolio for your photography. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. So try Squarespace at squarespace.com slash Tony and use the offer code portfolio to get 10% off. Squarespace, build it beautiful. I just want to thank Squarespace for making the show possible, for helping yeah. us teach people the history of photography, and um, also for just having a great platform for websites. I like my portfolio. Yeah, and I would suggest everybody following Ansel's footsteps in this way and put together a portfolio of 18 pictures like he did, your best work. And, and no, it's not necessarily all going to hold up and stand the test of time. It's not going to be the best work of, uh, in your entire lifetime, but it's still important that you take what you can of your existing body of work and compile it. It's so useful to look at your work this way. So set up a, square, a Squarespace portfolio for free at squarespace.com slash Tony. You don't even have to pay for it for 14 days. The, just the process of compiling your portfolio will help you out. So go ahead and give it a shot. And thanks Squarespace for sponsoring us. Another way to help us support this podcast is by going to iTunes and writing a review for us, giving us five stars if you think we deserve it, uh, or by liking if you're watching YouTube. Thank you. Yep. If you're watching on YouTube, pick up the audio version so you can listen to it while you drive or work out. And if you're listening to the audio version, audio version, check us out on YouTube, Tony and Chelsea Northup. Thank you. Thanks. 